Thank you. All right, so thanks for coming tonight and your interest in this. Um, I hope I'll inspire you to jump on the butterfly bandwagon by the end. Um, so without further ado, so this is a, just to mention a fritillary butterfly who uh, the caterpillars live on violets. So if you have violets in your lawn, you should keep them. And it overwinters in the leaf litter. So if you have leaves in your yard, uh, you wanna keep them there, otherwise, you will um, be raking them up and taking them to the curb. And, and then it nectars, in this case, on lots of different plants, including this beautiful orange butterfly weed, which is a type of milkweed. So just like to say that. Um, let's see, am I advancing? Next. Oh, here we go. I come to you as a master gardener today. I'm part of the Speakers Bureau. Um, and our master gardeners, uh, we as master gardeners, we promote integrated pest management. The idea here being that you should understand what's in your yard and find out what bug it is, for example, and know whether it's a good bug or a bad bug, because there are good bugs that help, um, help you. Uh, try to keep your materials on your yard, it, that land on your yard, in your yard. You know, try to minimize the amount of movement of materials on and off and all that sort of thing. So basically least toxic first in terms of managing your landscape and trying to maintain the or capture the stormwater that's on your property as well. So, um, so first of all, let's just start here. Uh, I like to, uh, I like this slide. It's kind of funny, but the idea here is, you know, we don't dress like this anymore and we really shouldn't be gardening like this anymore. And there's lots of reasons why that big lawns are no longer really appropriate in the modern era. Um, it turns out that in the last, since whatever, 30, 40 years, since 1970, we've lost nearly 3 billion birds from our environment. That's a huge reduction in birds. And there's multiple reasons, uh, habitat loss being a major one, and that's related to building of homes and farming and all kinds of things, but also what we plant in our landscape. And that's because it turns out that most terrestrial birds, those that live on land, need to feed their babies caterpillars. And as an example, this little bird here, the chickadee, black-capped chickadee, they need six to 9,000 caterpillars just to raise one nest of baby birds. So that's an awful lot of caterpillars just for one nest. You can imagine when you add up all the other birds in the, in the area. So how do you get caterpillars? Well, you need the right kind of plants because plants and insects and birds have all co-evolved, so they need each other. You can't, you can't use, uh, most caterpillars cannot feed on plants that aren't native to our region because they've co-evolved with those plants here. So if you take a crepe myrtle, for example, which is native to Asia, you will not find caterpillars on it or maybe just one or two species. But if you look at a native oak tree, you'll find over 500 different species of caterpillars can eat that eat the leaves on an oak tree. So it's really important what you put out in your landscape. And this is the monarch caterpillar, which is sort of an example of this, right? We all kind of, most of us know they can only eat milkweed plants. So if you take, you can't put this caterpillar on the wrong plant, it won't, it won't be able to feed, right? So you need to raise enough caterpillars to feed baby birds, you need the right kind of plants. And this is true, not just for trees, but for the herbaceous, uh, you know, ground layer plants as well with solidagos or goldenrods topping the list at 115 different species of caterpillars. So I always recommend adding goldenrods to your yard, but there's lots of other great plants on this list too. On top of that, native plants offer many other benefits. One of them is the deep roots that they have, especially when you compare them to turf grass, which is over here on the left. Turf grass roots are only about an inch or two deep. Native plants can go as deep as 15 feet. So this provides a lot of benefit. One is that they can access water deeper down so they don't need irrigation. They are locally adapted to our soil conditions. So they don't have fertilizers and all that stuff. They um, are better at holding the soil. So you have less erosion. Um, the soil, the roots poking through the soil, some of those roots every year will die and form little channels and allow water to percolate down into the soil so less of it's running off into our creeks and streams and causing all kinds of degradation of our waterways. So there's many benefits to natives from feeding birds to you know, uh, water quality. Plus they're really pretty. So 
All of those are reasons to consider adding natives to your yard. And I already mentioned this, but this is the fritillary and it's sitting on this plant. This plant is serving as its host plant. It's nectaring versus, I'm sorry, it's a nectaring plant versus a host plant. The host plant is when it can feed on the leaves. I'm sorry, I'm mixing myself up now. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about some definitions before I go on. And I do this right after I showed you that picture of the plant called butterfly weed. So what an unfortunate name for a beautiful plant. Well, what's a weed? A weed, a technical definition of a weed is that it's just a plant growing in the wrong place. So it just could be anything. It doesn't have to be native or not. It's just something that you don't want growing there. Native plants are the plants that have evolved and developed in a region for generally more in the category of thousands of years in a particular region. Invasive plants are plants that are not native and that they have certain traits that make them grow very quickly and you know, out compete the local native plants. So they disrupt the native plant communities. When I talk about some natives, I'll tell you they're aggressive. And I use that word very intentionally versus invasive because invasive implies non-native. Aggressive is a native plant that grows really quickly, which can be helpful sometimes when you're trying to compete with weeds. And then a cultivar is a plant that has been bred for very specific traits. It can be native or non-native. It's just that they've selected for some kind of uh, feature. Um, height is often the case. And I might, I can't remember, I talk about that here, but we can talk about that later if you have questions about cultivars, if I don't bring it up. So let's talk about how to pick your plants, which ones and how. I recommend focusing on plants that are native to the Piedmont region. That's a region that stretches beyond Maryland. It goes into Virginia and all the way up here into uh, Pennsylvania and further. But that's this this swath of Maryland, which is going to represent our, most match our soil conditions. You, we, I have in this talk a few plants that are native to the coastal region of Maryland. And the coastal region has tendency to be a little more sandy soil, different conditions. So while plants were often will grow in a different region, your best bet for finding plants that will thrive here are those that are you know, already well adapted to our local conditions. Other considerations, of course, deer, which probably you all have, I certainly do. And you can, you can grow native plants that are deer resistant, so that's a possibility. And then, you know, things like weeds. If you have lots of weeds, you might want to pick some aggressive plants um, to help out compete. And then your neighbors, try to make it look nice. So I have some tips along the way here about how to try to make a nice looking native garden. Native gardens are often thought of as being messy and, you know, like any garden, they can be if they're not tended, they do need tending just like everything else, but trying to do some intentional things to help make them look nice. Jumping right in, here we are at Brookside Gardens. Um, I have a number of examples where I've got like the broad overview of an area showing how you can use a native plant. So here's a really great demonstration of black-eyed Susans or Rudbeckia species used as a border on the edge of this lawn. And I thought it looked quite beautiful. So, and you can visit this place as a public garden. Um, so here we are, there's about, I don't know, there's a bunch of species. There's at least five different species of Rudbeckia. Some are tall, some are short. Um, the probably the most common one used in garden is Rudbeckia fulgida, which is uh, a type of black eyed Susan that tends to keep under three feet and is uh, a longer lived um, version. There's a Rebecca herta, which is a shorter lived variety, so, or species. So you can pick yours according to what your needs are, but there's also some tall ones that get up to five feet. So if you want a taller um, type of look, you can do that. Here's another example of them here in a rain garden on the side of a road. So you can see this is one tough plant handling the stormwater and salty runoff from this road. Uh, here's an example of a more formal style native garden at Mount Cuba Center, which is in Wilmington, Delaware. You can visit that place. It's a garden specifically devoted to using native plants in, in their gardens. And they did this, you can, you can see this intentionality in this garden, right? Repeated units, big, bold plantings, uh, the, taller, the taller in the back, the shorter in the front. These are all the kinds of things that you want to do to create a nice looking neighbor friendly kind of native garden. And I'll talk about a few of the plants in there. So one of them is goldenrod. Um, there are some 
goldenrods that like shade and there's goldenrods that like sun. Some of them are about two feet tall and some are five feet tall. So there's a goldenrod for everyone. And remember they host over 115 different types of caterpillars, which will get you butterflies. So get a, uh, find a goldenrod for your garden. Um, I like to point out that this little uh, thing up here, the Chelsea Chop. So that's named after a flower show in England. And the idea here is that you can, when, when the flower show is held, it's, I believe, now I'm gonna forget, late May, early April, I think it is, or I'm sorry, late April, early May. Oh, I think I need coffee. Anyway, um, the idea here is if you have a plant that tends to get too tall, you can cut it down at that time, at the time of the Chelsea Flower Show, by about a third, and then it will grow back shorter. The other way that this can be done is, I call this garden jujitsu. I let the deer do it for me. They eat the tops off of my goldenrod and then they grow back shorter. So it kind of works out and I don't have to do the work. Um, another beautiful native that was in that uh, image from the Mount Cuba Center is a uh, foxglove beer tongue. This is a beautiful, um, very deer resistant native plant that is a spring bloomer. And you can see the bumblebee is loving it going right on into the flower there. And if you leave the seed heads up, you get this really pretty, um, I think pretty structural thing of now, like this time of year and all the way into the fall, you have this seed head structure up. And if you look in there carefully, you'll see that there's a cocoon in there. So there's things living in this later on. So there's a life span of this plant that extends beyond when it has pretty flowers. There's another variety called hairy beard tongue, which is more purpley colored and uh, has a slightly different bloom time, well, pretty similar, but spring, but maybe blooms a little longer. The other really superpower of these plants, both of these beard tongues is that they have an evergreen rosette. So the leaves at the base stay green all the way through the winter. So you aren't just left with a patch of dirt, right? Sometimes plants will just completely disappear in the winter and you're kind of wondering if you planted something there, but these guys will stay there. And that is a powerful thing because it helps prevent weeds. So when you get your ground filled up with greenery, you will have fewer weeds, and that means less work for you. Another great plant is the aromatic aster, also deer resistant. Um, it is anything that has kind of a strong scent and or is furry, furry plants, these are the things that deer tend to avoid as a general rule. So things in the mint family, which there are quite a few natives, um, but this is a great plant. It's gonna bloom in the fall. It hasn't started blooming yet. Beautiful purple flowers attracting all kinds of pollinators. So get yourself an aster. Here's an example at Constitution Garden Park in Gaithersburg of some asters. This was not the aromatic. I think this might've been the smooth blue aster, but you get the idea of how pretty they are. And again, an intentional design. They're set far enough back on the sidewalk so you're not tripping over them. Really pretty with some tall native grasses and the monarchs are, are hanging out nectaring on them. Another kind of style for a garden, if you have some bigger spaces and properties, is this big kind of meadowy look. And again, I'm going to point out these big bold groupings of plants. That just makes for really a striking look. Um, and also the cue to care here is this fence. So this means cue to care, meaning somebody's done this intentionally. It wasn't, it didn't just show up and get crazy. You know, you have an edge with the fence and that's where the lawnmower knows where to stop and that keeps the plants from flopping over. And it really helps to define a garden to have some kind of edge. I use a lot of old logs and things around my garden. So that purple plant um, is, the uh, wild bergamot or Marinara fistulosa. And I have a little video and you can see all of the pollinators buzzing around. I like to point out all of these bees, I'm standing practically nose to nose with them. They're completely uninterested in me. Our native bees generally don't sting. They have no stingers actually, um, many of them. They're just totally focused on the getting, getting stuff from the flowers. So. Don't be afraid of attracting native bees to your garden. They're really not a problem. Um, pretty plant. And if you leave it standing up through the winter, you get this effect. It will actually stay up if it's surrounded by other plants and kind of supported. 
and I really love these little snow hats. This was the view out my front window at my house. Uh, I think this was two winters ago now, but um, it's fun. And there's critters that live in the stem. So you wanna leave these up for as long as you can. I usually don't ch cut my gardens down until sometime in March, really. I leave them up and then I leave about a six inch stem to keep uh, space, some material in there for insects that are living inside the stem. And I take the debris and I just put it over in some place on my property behind a shrub or something. So I don't have to look at a messy pile, but they, I haven't bagged it up and taken it to the curb. A uh, Joe pie weed is another beautiful native plant. It's just starting to bloom right now and it is a magnet for pollinators. You'll get all kinds of beautiful butterflies like these swallowtails on it. So another great native. Oops, hang on, I just jumped past. Um, in the, in the uh, same spaces that I have the uh, Monarda fistulosa, I have these oxeye sunflowers and I'm finding these to be amazingly deer resistant. Um, it's so much so that I can plant other things nearby them that they might kind of eat like purple coneflower, for example, and they tend to not find them. So if you mingle plants up and make it diverse, you have a little bit of safety from the deer that way. Um, and this is a great pollinator plant. You can see this green sweat bee on here. And I found this cool yellow crab spider hanging out one day. I thought it was actually the flower until I looked closely and realized what it was. So oxeye sunflower is a great native. It's kind of big, maybe too big for you, but um, here it is with the, with the monarda and another swallowtail butterfly on it. Really pretty, beautiful plants. Um, if it's too tall, you can go with sneezeweed, which is a shorter growing native plant, which has this really fun sort of button look on the top of it. Uh, pretty plant and also tends to be fairly deer resistant. I'm finding that they nibble them a little bit, but they come through. Um, here's another uh, native garden. This one's in North Potomac, which would be a little, not too far for you all to drive to. Um, on, the north, on the south side of Darnstown Road, um, this was put in by my friend, Mary Kay Smith, who may have spoken to you all, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's a great native garden. It's out there with all the deer and everything else. And you can see a beautiful display of flowers that are growing in spite of the deer presence. Um, she has purple cone flower in there. And you can see this is my example where it's mixed with the oxeye sunflowers and blooming in spite of the deer. Uh, she has rose mallow in there a gorgeous native. It's very tropical looking and very stunning. Um, the non, this is a cultivar, but the non cultivar version is also very pretty. It's just a white flower with a red, red in the center. So really pretty also. Uh, she has the native mint. Pigmanthemum is a, the native mint species and they're hosting all kinds of uh, pollinators, including this buckeye. This, these mints are really great for all of the little tiny native bees and other kind of critters like this guy, which I can't remember the name of, but I love the antennas on it. So lots of good plant, lots of good pollinators are on that plant. She has in that garden butterfly weed, which is a, again, a milkweed. This is the host of the uh, monarch butterfly and nectaring here is that fritillary now with its wings folded up. Um, she has grasses in there. There are a number of really beautiful native grasses. Probably my favorite is the little blue stem, which gets maybe only about two and a half or three feet tall. And it, it turns this sort of beautiful red tinge in the fall and will stay up through the winter waving around in the landscape, really pretty. However, it's kind of picky. It really wants well-drained soil and heat. So if you, if you have that really harsh place where nothing else will grow hot, dry, this is actually great for that spot. So. You can put it in there. If you don't have that condition, you could go with the broom sedge, which is maybe not quite as nice, but still really fun as a native plant, as a native grass. It, it, uh, I captured it uh, two winters ago doing this where when snow, it would kind of lean over and make these fun little tunnels. And then the snow would melt and it would stand back up. I did that a couple of times through the winter. So pretty, pretty uh, grasses for the winter time. Okay, so here's another garden. Um, this one's up in New York. It was part of a project that I participated in where we turned a pocket park into a garden. This used to be all just a big grassy area. We've got a lot of plants in here. This was mostly donated plant material. Um, in there was swamp milkweed, which is a 
this is probably one of the best milkweeds for your home garden. It's manageable, it doesn't get too big, it's easy to grow, the monarchs love it. You, I, I find more monarchs on this milkweed than I do on the butterfly wheat as a general rule. So, and it's got a beautiful pink flower. Um, all of the milkweeds make this fun pod in the fall, which breaks open and releases the seeds attached to this cool white stuff called floss and they float through the air. So that's a fun thing about milkweeds. Um, here we are with the swamp milkweed and I have a little video. So here's your monarch caterpillar feeding away on the swamp milkweed that's in my garden. But there's other things that live on milkweeds too. We're gonna scroll down here in just a minute and you'll see down here is a tussock milkweed caterpillar. Um, beware if you see these guys, they have these tufts on them. Whenever a caterpillar has that kind of fuzzy bit going on, that usually mean, means they're, they have stingers. So don't pet them. <laughs> They do sting. They don't reach out at you, but more often you kind of accidentally brush into them. That's usually what happens. And that's what happened to me. Anyway, great plant. Uh, there's also the common milkweed. This one is good if you have a lot of space because this one spreads by runners and will really occupy a lot of territory. So you have to be careful about that. And I'm sorry, whoops, jumping ahead. Um, I wanted to point out in here, sorry about the jumping around there. A katydid hanging out in here. This is the uh, milkweed beetle. So there's all kinds of things that live just on milkweeds. Milkweed beetles, the monarchs, there's a milkweed bug. There's other insects that I can't remember the name of, but it's a, it's a fun plant if you have the space for it because you get all kinds of interesting things going on. It's got a beautiful mauvey pink flower that has a really beautiful scent. So when you have a lot of them, you have this wafting scented garden. Um, and this is a capture from the Durwood Demonstration Garden in, in Durwood here, at the, it's the Agricultural History Farm Park. You can see how big a area the milkweed has taken over. So it's pretty big. And again, I'm standing in the middle of all these bees buzzing around me and they're unconcerned with me. They're just all over the plants. So it's a fun plant if you've got the space. It gets about, I would say about four and a half, four, to topping out at four and a half feet, I would say. All right, let's go on. Let's see. Um, let's talk about some vines. This is my favorite of the native vines. It's so pretty. Um, when I was living in, I moved from California to New York, and I thought that I would never see another hummingbird. And then I found out that there was one, but I didn't have the right plants. So when I planted this vine in New York, which is native up there, um, I, within the first year with the blooms, I had a hummingbird. So that was really fun. This is the trumpet honeysuckle. It has beautiful red flowers, as you can see. Obviously, that's what's drawing the hummingbirds to it. This one is native more to the coastal region. So you have to know that. It's not terribly picky, though. I'm growing it here on my property, which is not, you know, sandy soil or anything. It's doing great. It is not hugely deer resistant. Most of the other plants that I've shown you tonight are all deer resistant. This one is not. Um, what I've done is cage the bottom and I have some stuff on the backside here with logs and whatever. So the deer can't really get to it. And once it gets about four and a half to five feet tall, the deer tend to leave it alone. So they have a defined browse zone from about here down. So if you can get your plants tall enough, and this is true for trees and shrubs and other things, if you can protect the base and get them through, then the deer won't eat them. Another great vine is the maypop or purple passion flower. Um, this one, however, is super aggressive. So you'll plant it in one spot and literally it comes up, you know, a hundred feet away somewhere else. So I know people that have planted this and sort of regretted it and they're having to, it, you know, it pops up in the middle of their lawn and all over the place, but it's this gorgeous flower. It attracts, here's got, you've got an ant in this one here, but it attracts um, bumblebees and it makes an edible passion flower fruit. So that's a bonus. How about some shrubs? There's some beautiful native shrubs. This is winterberry holly, in this case growing as an ali. You can walk through this tunnel. Again, not super, um, uh, deer resistant, they will eat the leaves, 
But once it gets tall enough like this, they're going to leave this higher material alone. So if you get it tall enough, you can get past that problem. And really pretty in the winter with this red berry that's shocking standing out in the, in the landscape. Uh, a clethra. So this one's blooming right now. Um, it's a great later season pollinator plant when a lot of other things are kind of winding down. Your clethra shrub is coming in, fairly deer resistant. Uh, you can grow food in your garden. This is native blueberries, right? Blueberries are native. They are not deer resistant, so you better put them inside a fenced area or cage them up. Uh, a service berry is a small tree, which is great for sort of smaller yards or even bigger yards, you know, whatever. You can always put stuff in bigger yards. But for smaller yards, this is a nice smaller tree and it has edible fruit, really tasty edible fruit. So great tree. Uh, another great edible fruit tree is the pawpaw. And again, very well suited to a smaller yard. This is a yard friend of mine, Robin, down in Bethesda. And she wants to tell you that she loves this tree because this is her view out of her window in the fall when it turns this bright yellow. So great, great fall color and really spectacular edible fruit. And, and then I would be remiss if I didn't remind you that the best tree you can plant if you're trying to attract butterflies is an oak. That's the one that hosts the no most number of species of butterflies. So you can do a lot of good by planting an oak tree. So if you've got the space, add an oak to your landscape. There's a lot of different um, types of oak trees. This one is one of the swamp oaks with the big knobby leaves, but there are oaks that grow in drier conditions as well. So kind of whatever your conditions, you can find an oak tree for it. And if you have, the right plants, you get things like this beautiful butterfly, this beautiful luna moth, I should say, um, which what I found, I was pulling weeds one day and I looked up and there it was, it had just come out of its cocoon or, uh, you know, just pupated and it was on the trunk of a butternut. I have butternuts on my property, which are native. They're sort of rare and they have a tendency to suffer from a disease. So I know, don't know that I would recommend you add one nowadays because of the disease problem. Mine seem to be hanging in there. They are, have been here a long time and they're perhaps just strong enough or something. But at any rate, you can plant a lot of other trees and still get this beautiful moth, including, hey, edible persimmons. That's another edible one there. So let's talk a little bit about some shade things because you might have a shade garden instead of all that sunny space. How about sedges? They are kind of grass looking, um, deer resistant. So all the ferns and all these carex, the sedges are all in the carex um, genus. There's over 200 different species of carex that can handle everything from dry shade to wet situations. Um, you can find you know, a carex for you if you need one. Um, ferns also all deer resistant. They tend to just not eat ferns. So you can have a, if you have a shady spot, you can do ferns. Usually ferns want moisture conditions. Some of them can handle a uh, dry, particularly Christmas fern. I think I have a picture of that coming up. Um, there's also a native pachysandra, this guy right here and right here. It's not super deer resistant. Um, I find that depends on where I put it on my property. If I kind of mingle it up, it does okay. And then there's things like may apples, which are a more of a short-term spring situation, but um, still a really interesting plant and the box turtles like their fruits, so you can attract other things. Ostrich fern can be spectacular in the right setting. Um, it gets really huge if it likes the place, but it's very aggressive. So you need to know that when you plant it that you have the right spot, you're gonna have a lot of ostrich fern, so just beware. Um, cinnamon ferns, very spectacular when they bloom in the spring with this big orangey cinnamon looking spike. Um, sensitive ferns are another low growing kind of interesting one. They're called sensitive fern because they're one of the first to get hit by frost. Um, here was the Christmas fern I was mentioning. It really, um, in the woods, you will frequently find it on well-drained slopes. It likes drier conditions. So if you have a drier spot, you could try a cinnamon fern. I mean, sorry, Christmas fern. So uh, weed suppression. What's the magic behind weed suppression? It's covering your ground. 
This is Rock Creek Park. The only bare ground is the place where the path is. Everything else has got a plant in it. If you make a bare space, a plant will find that spot. Usually it's gonna be an invasive weed. So if you wanna avoid that, you need to fill it with something that you want instead. And we call that green mulch, planting densely, filling ground, no bare soil, no mulch. Um, some great plants for that are lyre leaf sage. This is a native. It's a low growing ground cover with an evergreen leaf. Again, that, that, that weed suppressing you know, superpower when you keep your leaves all winter long, there's never bare ground and the weed seeds don't really get any sunlight and they never really get a chance to get going. This will seed profusely and cover the ground quickly. Uh, Pacara, this is fantastic for moist, shady conditions. This is where it loves to be. It forms a very dense green, evergreen ground cover with these pretty leaves and a beautiful um, early spring yellow bloom. So here's a nice combo. A friend of mine in Silver Spring has done her yard in this. And it's really pretty in the spring. Beautiful, beautiful lyre leaf sage and pacara growing together with some ferns. And I'm gonna actually, I'm just gonna back up and repeat this. Notice there is not, I mean, okay, a little bare ground up in here front, but no bare ground. That's really important to keep that weed situation under control. So again, I'll repeat leaving the leaves. I talked about that a little bit. That's where a lot of your, um, uh, butterflies are overwintering in the leaf litter. So if you put them all in bags, you're sending all your, your butterflies off to the compost facility. And similarly with a lot of the leaf stalks, there's lots of things living in those hollow stems. You'll kind of start looking now and notice that a lot of times your native plants have hollow stems. There's things that live in there. And so if you can leave that up through the winter and just maybe cut it down in like March or so, and then keep the material on your property, right? You're going to keep your Keep your insects on your property. How do you do this? Uh, this is that New York project. We started with turf grass. We covered it in cardboard and newspaper and we got uh, donated mulch. I usually recommend undyed mulch. This is just what we got. So we got dyed mulch, but it's better to just use undyed mulch. You can use chip drop if you're familiar with that. You can get free wood chips from an arborist. So whatever the method, but just cover up your area with a layer. Uh, mulch is usually about two or three inches deep over the top of the paper. And then you have a clean planting space. That's the key is you want to keep all the weed seed underground. Do not disturb the soil. Plant right through all that mulch. Don't move it away or anything. And we were a very low budget project. So we didn't really have a lot of plants and we had a lot of space between our plants. Normally, you know, if you can do six inches between your plants, it's better because you get quicker coverage of the ground and that gets you to a place where you're weeding less sooner. Um, but we did a lot of weeding. It's my friend, Brian and Sue, and they're out there adding in plants and weeding and all that. That took a couple years, but by year three, here's what, we, here's what we had. It was gorgeous. And it spurred the local library to put in a native garden and the village got on board and started gardening. You know, so this was the, beginning of uh, many other projects in the community. It was really fun. We had hummingbirds visit this garden too, which was great. Okay, so you're sitting through this going, yeah, but I just, I have, I'm in a condo and I have a patio. What can I do? You can grow natives in pots. They actually do really well. Um, I kind of encourage you to choose them, the, choose the ones that are sort of tolerant of tough conditions because often pots don't get watered. Um, especially if you're going to put it in the sun. This is a sunnier one and I added in some violets in this one just because I figured out oh, I'll have some winter color. I've been playing with this for about a year now and I'm really having pretty good luck. I haven't had anything poop out on me. So um, all these plants I have listed here are doing fine in the pots. Um, this is more of a shady, shady setup and I have a really great pot right now that has maidenhair fern, uh, wood fern, um, what's the other thing? Oh, I've got, it had a weedy uh, thing called uh, clear, um, uh, clear weed, which I didn't even plant, but it was in there and it was native. I was like, oh, I'll let you go. And it turned out really well. So you, you play with it, you know, have fun. So what's the butterfly bandwagon? Well, if you're planting natives on your property, you're part of it. The idea is that we want to be able to connect habitat patches together 
so that our butterflies can find food. So if we start out with this scenario where the patch is a long way away from the other patch, they can't maybe travel that far. Um, same with the bees, right? How far can they really travel? Um, probably some of them can do a long distance, maybe a few miles, but often it's a lot shorter than that. We're talking, you know, hundreds of feet or so. So the closer we can get our patches, the easier it is they can move from food source to food source. And eventually if we can fill everybody's yard up with even just a little patch of natives, they can hop across or travel through from corridor to corridor. And we maintain our insect populations. We increase our bird populations. You know, everything gets better. So add a patch. And then now that you know how to do it, you can help your neighbor. And in a couple of years, you'll find out that your native plants have propagated and you have more than you can use. And that's when you start really getting on the butterfly bandwagon because now you're sharing your plants. And that's actually really what the Wild Ones is all about here. This is an organization we were talking about earlier that it promotes the use of native plants and landscaping. We have a local Chesapeake chapter and we do that. We share with each other, we share knowledge, we share plants, we have meetings, we give tours of each other's yards. It's really fun. So get involved with that group if you're interested. Um, some of the stuff I've talked about tonight comes out of the work of Doug Ptolemy. He's an entomologist at the University of Delaware. And he um, has been the one studying the number of insects on different plant species. So if you're interested in that, he's quite inspirational. Look for him and talks. Some of them are available online. He has several very publicly accessible books out now on this topic as well. You can learn about your pollinators. And I, we were talking about that too. Once you kind of get into this, you start noticing your pollinators and start learning their names a little bit. And it's actually really fun. They're quite interesting insects. Um, they're the, the, uh, the milkweed uh, bug has a really rather large migration like the monarch. So there's just crazy bug things going on that you don't even know about. Um, if you're trying to figure out which plants to plant, that's always the big hurdle really. Uh, this is a wonderful resource, the Native Plants and Wildlife Habitat for, uh, for Conservation Landscaping. It's specifically good because it's plants for our region. So you're not trying to figure out, well, is that one native here or not? Use this use this as your resource and they have it now as a um, online uh, tool. So you can go to nativeplantcenter.net to find this resource as a searchable database. And you can put in like sun, uh, moist, you can put in uh, the time of bloom, I think, and the height and some other criteria and it'll spit you out a list. The one downside to this is that many of the plants in this booklet are not generally available for sale. So that's a big other hurdle. And the place, the way I recommend you avoid that problem is that you can also go to either Chesapeake Natives, which is a native plant not for profit, and they go out and they have permits to collect seed in wild spaces, and then they grow the plants from seed and sell them to the public. Similar kind of organization is Earth Sangha. They're based in Virginia, but in Northern Virginia, not too far away. Those two places have very high quality plant material native really to our region. And they're great not-for-profits doing a really great service. So you can skip this whole searching thing and just go look at what they have. Find out what they have online. Uh, Chesapeake Natives actually has a pretty nice uh, layout where it tells you a little bit about the plant. I forget if, or Sangha, I think they have that too, but you know, you can say, well, does it like sun or does it like shade or wet or dry or whatever. So use those resources because that'll save you a lot of heartache. If you go through this book and you pick out, you see some pretty flower and you go, oh, wow, I really want that. And then you find out you can't buy it. Then it's just very frustrating. So do it the other way around and it'll save you a lot of trouble. Um, get to know your innate, your invasives, right? That's another thing. The first step in this whole process is getting the invasives out, creating a, a weed-free planting space. If you get away from the weeds, if you can control your weed population, you will have much greater success. That's usually the place that people kind of fall down as the weeds get ahead of them and then they have a big mess on their hands. So 
And in Montgomery County, we are very lucky. They did not have this kind of program up in New York where I used to live. Um, Rainscapes is a rebate program. If you do a project on your property that helps to manage the stormwater, you can get a rebate to cover partial or sometimes all of the cost of the project. Um, among those projects are conservation landscaping and rain gardens, which are two things that use native plants. So you can get a native plant garden while managing your stormwater and get money back. So that's a fantastic combination of things. Uh, the University of Maryland Extension has some native plant resources. Actually, I need to update this because they just changed their website. What I recommend is that you, uh, you just do a search for Maryland Extension native plants or something like that, and it'll take you hopefully to the correct page because those pages have changed. And this is kind of the end here. This is one of the over 30 unique box turtles that I found. I have 3.7 acres in Durwood area, and I moved here four years ago, and I've been counting turtles, and there's a bunch of them, and they, they live up to 100 years. Um, my house was built in 1980, so some of these turtles may predate the house. And they don't travel very far. They live within a few hundred uh, yards of where they were born. So my goal is to garden for the turtles at this point. And I'm hoping that I'm doing good things so that I'll have more of them in the future. So with that, I will stop sharing and take any questions that may have come up in the chat box. All right, let's see, Do we have, I don't, I don't see any chat. Question. No, yes. we, we don't have any in the chat yet. So okay. feel free to send any questions in the chat or unmute and ask them. My first question would be, could you talk a little bit more about what the process would actually be like trying to get some native seeds or plants from some of the nonprofits that you talked about? Sure. So uh, they're, they work in various ways. And another one I'll mention, actually, because it just I just learned about it the other day and I forgot to mention that. Our, our parks department in Montgomery County um, also offers some sales. And the thing about those that, and, and I'll, one other organization is the Muddy Branch Alliance. And the reason that I'm bringing Earth Sangha, Chesapeake Natives, Locust Grove Nature Center as a parks department place, and the Muddy Branch Alliance, all of those places are offering what's called ecotype native, lo locally native plants. Those are plants that the seed was collected regionally here in Maryland, uh, or Sangas in Virginia, but close enough. And they are growing the seed up and selling it back to the public. And the importance of that is that you're maintaining the genetic material local to our area, as opposed to um, you can go to, you can go to Home Depot and you can buy some native plants. They do sell them sometimes. The downside is that those native plants have probably been grown in a huge greenhouse somewhere in the Midwest. So the starting material for them, one, it probably, it might not even have been a seed. So it could very well have been a cutting or even tissue culture, which means that every plant in that collection has exactly the same set of genes. There's no diversity going on. And that's a little dangerous because, you know, the, the uh, well, we've all gotten much more, you know, comfortable with the idea of mutations. And unfortunately, we're learning a lot about, you know, viral diversity and what all that means. But th the idea here is that nature thrives in diversity. You can be more resilient when you're diverse. You can survive insect pests and viruses and all kinds of things when you have lots of diversity in your gene pool. So we want to maintain what we have right here in Maryland because it's been evolving here. It's unique to here. As much as you can help to support that, the better. It's a little bit harder sometimes to do that, but I do think it's worth it if you, if you can help out in that way. So that's why I do that. So how do you order from them or whatever? Uh, Earth Sangha, I'm not sure what they're doing right now, uh, whether it's been, you know, COVID has, of course, has caused everybody to have to do something different. So uh, I think they were doing online and then you went and picked it up. I don't know if they're still doing that. Um, Chesapeake Natives has been doing online and pick up and then they just started hosting some open houses. So you can actually go look at the plants, which is kind of fun. 
Um, Locust Grove is doing a combo of that too, where they have an online order date, which I think is like August 22nd, and then, or something, I could have that date wrong, but close to that. And then they're having an in-person day, which is, in, I believe, in September, although I'm not sure. So you'll have to look that up. I just saw that come out the other day. But those are places that are doing really great things. Muddy Branch Alliance, um, I help with that sale, so I know about it. They host a sale in the springtime. And if you want to know about that, I recommend uh, signing up for their newsletter where they announce the sale. But we're, we're getting, at the Muddy Branch Alliance and the Locust Grove, we're getting our material through the county uh, production site called Pope Farm. And it's not, Pope Farm is not normally uh, accessible to the public. You can't go there and buy things. They grow for the parks, but they do these things where they provide material for these special sales, you know, a couple times a year. So that's a unique setup. Okay, long answer, hope it. <laughs> no, no, that's exactly what I was curious about. Thank okay. you. I sure. see another question that says, can you talk about some of the useful, useful Facebook pages? Oh, yes. Um, so uh, we were talking about that before the talk started, you know, where you can go to. So, so Wild Ones is a kind of place if you're interested in being part of this sort of, I call it the butterfly bandwagon, you know, this group of people that are working together, you know, what are the, what are the hurdles to entry to getting your native plant going? That's kind of where this all started because I do a lot of outreach. I ran a national fish and wildlife funded project up in New York and I was surveying people and trying to find out well, what, what, what is it that makes it hard for people? And what's hard for people is actually the biggest hurdle was figuring out how, the time it takes to learn how to do this. So if someone in your neighborhood knows how and can share, that saves you that whole big difficult challenge of learning. Um, so resources in this area, uh, I love this group. It's called the uh, Maryland Area Environmentally Conscious um, Gardeners page. Or I may have messed that name up a little bit, but it's close. Um, that's on Facebook. And you can go on there and they'll answer questions. People are really knowledgeable. Uh, they share plants, they help each other, they share pictures. It's a very, very supportive group, very friendly. So if you're looking for, you know, just a community of people who are trying to do this, that's a great place to start. And then the other place, is, as I mentioned, is Wild Ones, um, which is not as active online. We're trying, but uh, we're we're I think we're I think we're an older demographic, <laughs> and not quite as uh, you know up to this to the level of the Facebook posting and all that. But um, there is a Facebook page for that group. Uh, I think it's it's either Wild Ones Chesapeake or Chesapeake Wild Ones, which is a little embarrassing that I can't remember since I made the page. But um, one of those names, uh, and it's you know very supportive group very helpful. Uh, if you become a member, you get invited to a, uh, a, uh, a email forum kind of setup where you can post uh, questions and share information. And that group is doing uh, garden tours and things like that. So um, that's really fun. And we do some plant swapping, which is also fun. So lots of opportunities to get free plants and um, learn things. And I do some of my native ecotype plants that I have acquired have come through that group because people have certain things that are unique or maybe they bought some from Chesapeake natives and grew them up and then can share them or something. So yeah, you don't have to spend an arm and a leg. I'm the, I'm the cheapest gardener you've ever met. I'm very, uh, I reuse, recycle. I have a giant stash of cardboard in my garage that I got at Christmas time. You know, like I'm out there scrounging off the side of the road whenever I can, whatever. I can do to save a few dollars so that I can buy some more cool plants, but then I will grow them from seed once I have a few growing and then I get a different kind, you know? So constantly finding ways to try to keep the budget down while filling up my yard with natives. How does planning planting compare to other plants where you have to plan by a certain time in the season to have them in the ground? Is it similar or is it a little bit less strict because they're native plants? I would say similar. So the reality is that anytime you, you know, 
take a plant and disturb the roots. And because na native, one native, once native plants are in and growing and have that nice big root system, then they're very tough. But in the beginning, they're just as delicate as anything else, pretty much. So you have to be sensitive to that. So the recommended time for planting is, uh, you know, in the spring, once the, the soil is, is no longer frozen, um, really any time, that's okay. Although you kind of want to avoid doing a lot of soil disturbance when it's super wet because you can, you can affect the soil structure. Um, but more importantly, it's like, you don't want to be frozen. And then you really, I just don't do any planting in July and August. Too hot, too stressful. You're having to use a lot more water. So if you're thinking about it from a sort of resource management perspective, you know, you don't really want to have to be watering every other day and all that, which if you are planting in July or August, you're going to be watering every other day to keep them happy and surviving. And it's just very hard on the plants. So your probability of failure is, is higher. So it's better to wait. Um, I start planting again, usually a few weeks into September when the temperatures have dropped a little bit and I don't have to water as much, but reality is you're, you're watering your new garden for the first year, at least. Um, I can kind of get away from that in my property where I have spaces that are really far from the house. What I, I, the way I plant on my property with the size, I plant the things that are the farthest from the house, the earliest in the spring. And I will put them in the ground and I will give them one, one dose of water that moment, at the moment that I planted them within 15 minutes of planting. So very quickly, plant water, plant water. That's the last time I ever water those plants. And I actually have really pretty good success. I try to plant prior to a rainstorm. So I take advantage of mother nature to really soak the ground around them. I've had amazing success with that. It really, it's pretty good. But, um, you know, as, as the summer moves, as the, as the temperatures warm up and by, you know, June, I'm planting near the house because now I can water them. So I take advantage of that of access to a hose to kind of get the last ones in before it gets too hot. And then I just stop and hold everything until, so I have, I have several hundred plants in my little nursery area right now that I'm holding until the September time when I can get back to it again. And meanwhile, I'm now weeding. So I'm in weeding mode right now. I'm preparing areas. I'm making sure they're clean. So when September rolls around, I'll be at, back out there um, going as fast as I can. I'm trying, you know, I, for a while there, I was trying to plant hundred plants a day, which I was sort of failing at, but you know, I squeaking in at the end of the day or whatever, as much as I can. I'm, I'm attempting to replace my turf grass um, when I moved in to this house, I, I left a house in New York that had no more turf grass. And I moved into a property that takes me an hour and a half to mow with a 42 inch ride, wide ride on mower. So, wow, that's a lot of lawn, you know? <laughs> so we're trying to uh, reduce our turf. I don't know that we'll get rid of all of it, but we're trying to get it down to the point where we will maybe just need a little push mower at the end, just for a few areas and some paths and things like that. So right now I've got 2000 square feet of area covered in wood chips that I'm preparing. I won't have enough plants, but I'll hold it and keep adding, you know, over time. So that's kind of how I do it. I'm curious, I've heard that eating raw local honey is something that can be beneficial to helping if you have seasonal allergies. Would planting native plants have some of a similar effect just in getting you used to some of the local pollens? Hmm. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I will mention that, uh, so a couple of things. So I, I've heard the thing about the honey too, and I I'm going to assume it's true because I've heard it so many times, but I really don't know that as, you know, I, I'm a biologist with a PhD and I hesitate to say things that I don't know for a fact. So I'm hedging on that. Um, but it does seem like a thing that people do. So who knows? Um, 
native, so note that honeybees are not native. That's important to understand. And it's really kind of important to understand because it turns out that uh, honeybees, honeybees live really differently than native bees. And I'm, 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 I think I'm kind of answering this like a politician, like I'm taking your question and answering a different answer, but it's important. So I'm gonna go do it anyway. Honeybees live in colonies with, you know, I don't know, thousands of bees or whatever in a colony. In that setting, they are prone to diseases. All these bees grouped up together in tight quarters, you know, we again, we've learned this lesson this year too, right? When you get crowded up together, you pass diseases around. So if you host, if you raise honeybees, you just need to understand that they are not native to North America and they do have a lot of diseases. And so you need to treat them. And it's important to treat them if you have honeybees because the diseases they get can be passed on to the native bees. And native bees don't live in big colonies. They live usually singly in like tunnels in the ground or in a hollow stem of a, of a plant or something like that. So they don't have the same disease problem on their own. They don't get diseases, but they can get the disease from the honeybees if you have them. So you've got to be careful with your honeybees if you do raise them. And I don't have anything, I'm not, you know, against raising honeybees. It's just, you need to understand that they're more like an agricultural thing than they are. You're, you're not really benefiting the environment by raising honeybees because native bees do a better job of pollinating our native plants than honeybees do. So, or, and the crops for that matter. So it's not really, you're not really helping the environment by raising honeybees. Um, would, uh, would growing native plants help with your pollen allergies? Uh, my, gut, my gut guess is probably not. Um, the, the allergies that are, people are most commonly allergic to a thing called ragweed, which is a native plant. So I would suggest that you probably not plant that in your yard. It's not a very attractive native plant. It's not one that people you know, it doesn't have like a showy flower or anything. So it's not something you would probably purposely add in. Um, a lot of people blame uh, goldenrod for their allergies because it uh, blooms at the same time as ragweed, but that's actually turns out to not be, it's got like really sticky pollen. So it's not the thing that's floating around, it's the ragweed. So if you have ragweed, pull it out, that's okay. You're allowed to edit your native plant garden and that's fine with me. If you don't like something, you know, like I said, a weed is just a plant growing in the wrong place. So if you don't like it, yank it, so, or cut it. I hope that kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> a little diversion on the honeybee thing, but you know, it's good to know. <laughs> Would anyone else like to unmute and ask a question or feel free to send one in the chat? And I'll, I should share, um, coming up on, good if I remember the date. So I work as the program manager for the Muddy Branch Alliance's Lands Green Waters Clean Program. Coming up on uh, August 21st, we have a uh, native meadow tour happening at the Isaac Walton League of America in uh, Gaithersburg. So if you're interested in seeing, it's a relatively young meadow just planted from seed last year. And it, it's an interesting process to see how that works and learn about how it was done and everything. So if you're interested in that, um, go to, I think the Muddy Branch Alliance is, you know what, you could email me, it might be easier and I'll send you a link to the sign up thing. But um, we are encouraging people to sign up because we'll have a rain date if for some reason there's a rain issue. And we're gonna be doing uh, some stream monitoring that day. So we'll do some testing of the, the Muddy Branch Creek, which runs right by there too, um, for some pollutants and things like that. So if you're interested in any of that, feel free to join in. Thank you so much. Sure. Do we have any last questions? Who's going native? <laughs> yeah, I see at least one hand. Can't see everybody else, but hopefully you are. So share, you know.
I hope everyone else enjoyed tonight's presentation as much as I did and learned something new. And of course, if you think of any questions later, feel free to email us info at postfulseniors.org and we can pass them on for you. If you'd like to unmute and turn on your camera now to say goodbye, now's the time. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, please leave a like and comment. We'd like to thank Lauren so much for this presentation as well as our ongoing sponsors and contributors that help us keep our programs going because we love putting them on for you. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider joining us for more upcoming events. Like I mentioned, we'll be back this time next week with Professor Christine Rye and Sip and Sample Wine and Cheese Pairings. You can go to our website, PoolsvilleSeniors.org, for more info and registration. Thank you all so much for attending, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you so much. You, Thank you.